Okay. Oh, that's freaky when it does that. Okay. Right. Let me have a look at it. <laughs> Hit some more buttons. <laughs> Bear with me a moment. <coughs> but also a little bit of information technology thrown in <laughs> for good measure. It's lovely to be here. It really is. Uh, my day job is training the next generation of outstanding teachers at the University of Roehampton. Any Roehampton alumni in the room? Ah, oh, that's nice to see. I was up in Manchester last week. Not quite so many hands up there. Happy memories, folks. Oh, that could go either way. <laughs> I'm on the board of computing at school. I'm on the board of NACE. Um, I was also part of the drafting team who put together the new computing programs of study. So blame me or thank me, depending on how you feel about those. Um, what I'm going to do is talk to you a little about the ideas behind what we've done. I'm then going to walk you through the content of the Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2 programs of study, and then we'll go and get a coffee. Um, and we'll take it from there. So if we had a bit more time, I'd say break into pairs, talk about what your curriculum is for as a school. And it is worth thinking about that question. What are your aims? What are your ambitions? What are you trying to do? with your school's curriculum. The Roehampton trainees, and it's nice to have one or two of them in the room, hate it when I then do this bit of show what the answer should have been. This is your statutory duty. So you as a school have an obligation to do this in terms of your school's curriculum. Education Act 2002 hasn't yet been repealed. Hopefully it won't be. Promote the spiritual, moral, cultural, mental, physical development of pupils at your school and of society, and prepare pupils at your school for the opportunities responsibilities and experiences of later life. If you're sat there thinking, we don't do that, you need a conversation with your head teacher fairly urgently, I would suggest. But hopefully everybody is thinking, yes, that's exactly what we do, and that's exactly what we should do, preparing them for the opportunities, experiences, responsibilities of later life, and ensuring their best development in all of those dimensions as rounded individuals, and of course, of society as a whole. It's not just about the individual. I'd love to hear at break time what you're doing to promote the physical development of society. Okay, the new national curriculum adds a layer on top of that. The aims for the new national curriculum go further than what you have under the 2002 Act. And the Secretary of State, bless him, says, the national curriculum provides pupils with an introduction to the essential knowledge that they need to be educated citizens. Much of, much of it is focused on knowledge. It introduces them to the best that has been thought and said. Matthew Arnold, culture and anarchy coming in there. Helps engender an appreciation of human creativity and achievement. These are not bad things. These are actually really good things. And part of what we do as school is to pass on the best of our generation and our forefathers' generations to the next generation, isn't it? Education is cultural transmission. That said, there may be some amongst you who are thinking, the best way to prepare my pupils for the opportunities, responsibilities, and experiences of later life might involve a bit more than just passing on the best of my generation and my forefathers' generations to the next generation. There's a little, this is very much forward thinking stuff, isn't it? About preparing for the future. And this is kind of looking back to the past and passing that on to the next. But don't worry, paragraph 3.2 is the reassurance you need. The national curriculum is just one element in the education of every child. There's time and space in the school day and in each week, term, and year to range beyond the national curriculum specifications. I hope you're reassured by that. Um, no? Okay. 
they don't let me out enough to go and supervise our trainees out in school at Roehampton. I wish they did, but after what happened, no, we won't talk about that. Um, so, if you, do you remember the lesson plan form from your teacher training days? Yeah, national curriculum objective. You know, how does this relate to the programs of study? If it was me supervising my trainees, I'd say, you can leave that blank. It doesn't have to relate to the national curriculum. Or just write in paragraph 3.2. That's all, all the coverage that you need, yeah? <laughs> Put your hand up, please, if you're doing a school play end of last term. Okay, that's not as many as I'd have thought. Brilliant opportunity for a bit of computational thinking, algorithms, decompositions, all of that jazz going in there. But that's not on the national curriculum. And yet it's still something which many of us think it's well worth teaching children in private school. So if there's something you're passionate about, if there's something you're enthusiastic about, if there's something your pupils would like to learn about, please do teach it. Teach the rest of the program study as well, but you can teach anything else you want. Okay, Hold on to that as we go through the program study. So how do you decide what to teach? I think William Morris did it pretty well. Don't put anything in your houses unless you know that it's useful or believe that it's beautiful. Isn't that a good rule for curriculum design? Put onto your curriculum you think the things you know they're going to find useful, skills if you will. Don't tell the Secretary of State their skills, obviously, so it's poor knowledge. Okay? But also teach the things which you believe in your heart of hearts they will find interesting. You, you believe that are interesting. Now, I think we've done that with the program of study for computing. You are welcome to disagree with me. You've still got to teach it, but you're welcome to disagree with me. Okay, so this is where we were five years ago. Jim Rose, the QCDA, reviewing the whole of the primary curriculum, but I see it at its center as one of the things that she's essential for learning and life. And this was his, or possibly his civil servant's, definition of ICT capability. We're five years on. Looking back at that now, does, is there anything that strikes you as missing from that as a definition of ICT, primary ICT capability? Don't all rush at once. Can't talk with them before we're talking at the same time. Right, thank you. Absolutely. I mean, two observations there in one very nice, helpful sentence. That was 140 characters or less due to eat it. Okay. <laughs> what you've got going on there is a focus on using technology. Yeah about using things which other people have made, about being able to get useful stuff done using, oh, apparently it's time to sing, <laughs> okay, about <laughs> using stuff that are, using software that others have made. But there's also, you know, no mention of the creativity there. Surely that was part of what we were doing in our ICT lessons back in 2009. Yeah, lots and lots of lovely creative work going on. How could Jim Rose have missed that. How could I, when I responded to this, have missed out saying, Jim, you've not mentioned creativity there. Surely that's an essential part of what we've been doing in ICT lessons. So where do we move on to? Well, this is what we have in the first sentence of the new program study. If you take one thing away from this session, it's this one sentence. A high quality computing education equips pupils to use computational thinking and creativity to understand and change the world. Now, how's that for <coughs> ambitious? I look forward to Ofsted coming in and confirming, you know, have your pupils use computational thinking to understand the world. That's what we're trying to do with the new program study. It isn't about coding. It's about understanding the world, and it's about self-expression through digital media. Yeah? Now, the best way to develop this computational thinking is, I'm sure, through the practical lab work of programming computers. But our aim is not programming as an end in its own right. Our aim goes far beyond that. Yeah? It's about understanding the world around us. Now, creativity we've been doing a lot, as, as you know. Computational thinking is relatively new, though. And we're still kind of working our way around exactly what we mean by this. But there's a degree of consensus around the stuff on the left-hand side of the screen of the brain there, that it is about using logical reasoning, that they are entirely deterministic machines. If you set them up the same way, if you give them the same input, then they will produce the same output, unless you're running Windows 7, I suppose. Okay, <laughs> they follow that we need to think about the way to solve problems. 
It's the step-by-step -step approach, the secret, the set of instructions, the set of rules that we follow. And learning to program a computer is about learning to solve problems through that sort of attention to detail, step-by-step -step approach. That generally, when we're programming computers and with wider applications, we break things down into smaller parts and deal with each of those separately. I remember a former colleague of mine doing the assembly on how to eat an elephant. Anybody, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, okay? <laughs> no, that's exactly it. And then this crucial idea of abstraction, which I never do particularly well explaining. Essentially, we forget about the detail and concentrate on the things that matter. So who here came by tube today? Okay, so they're still working. That's good. Okay, you'll be familiar with the tube map. That throws away a load of the detail. It doesn't show you what the stations look like. It doesn't even show you how far apart the stations are but it captures the essential information you need about what order they come in and where do you change between one line and another. And computer, thinking about programs, program problems from a computing or computational thinking point of view involves capturing that sense of what's the important stuff and we can get somebody else, typically, to worry about that level of detail. And then a good computer scientist, typically, is a lazy computer scientist, no offense intended, okay, that we're looking for the simpler, more efficient, more elegant way of doing things. That if somebody else has solved a similar problem, we can borrow their ideas and possibly borrow their code in our problems too. So looking for the generalizable results, looking for how we can take one idea and apply it to a whole other class of similar situations. And then the stuff on the right-hand side of the screen of the brain is there about the approaches that you take, that typically you're going to play with stuff. We're allowed to say play. We're you know, Further up in primary school, we'll talk about exploration and experiment, but it's the same essential idea of taking something and seeing how it works, of tinkering with it, of adapting something to a new purpose. And at its heart, it is a creative discipline. We make things. We learn best, as Papert recognized so many years ago, we learn best through making things to show to other people, our programs, our code. Okay, And we learn so much through testing things, through fixing things when they're not working. I've heard the statistic, I don't know how accurate it is, that programming is 20% writing code and 80% fixing code. So the debugging is going to be such an important part of this. And you learn so much through those situations where it doesn't work, as you expect. And coding is the new gaming that we learn through, we learn about persevering because it doesn't work first time and we stick at it and we stick at it. Who here learned an instrument when they were growing up? That's great, it really is. Why did your parents want you to do that? So you get a job as a professional musician? Perhaps, but perhaps because it told a certain amount of self-discipline, of persevering, of tenacity there. And of course, computing particularly, now since the internet is the collaborative activity, we're working with other people, it's not an isolating thing. Is there anything on that list which you would not like to see a little more of in your primary school classroom? That's fine. Okay, there may be other ways of getting there, but this is what we're interested in doing in terms of computational thinking. Who are the early years people in the room? It's lovely to have you here, it really is. Um, these are called Froebel Rocks. I'm working at Froebel College at Roehampton <laughs> University. Froebel invented the kindergarten, and he also invented this sort of construction toy of, putting, of giving a child in the early stages of their development things like this to play with. And you'll be familiar with. With something which is, you know, has points in common. You know, this is another construction, a more recent one. Oh, it's a lovely wooden thing, Daniel Joking has it here. It's a toy in this parts, yeah? Why do we give children things like that to play with, please? Beg pardon? Problem solving, they want to build a particular structure. How can they do that? You've got to think of the steps in order to build a thing, just as you did with your ducks earlier. Anything else? Any other reasons? Mo absolutely fine motor skills, and indeed gross motor skills. Really important thing for a child to learn. Anything else that a child learns? Imagination expressing creativity, absolutely. Any other reasons? Sorry? To develop their thinking. What do you mean by that? Absolutely, the problem solving skills, things which on the previous slide I might have tried to claim as computational thinking, but actually we've been doing for quite a while now. There are other things. It is open ended, it's a chance for the child to express themselves. You can use the blocks in so many ways. I think Froebel would have said, and Piaget after him would have argued, 
that through playing with blocks like this, a child comes to understand how the world works. Let go of a block and gravity will act on it. The number of blocks doesn't change. Some, some <coughs> constructions are more stable than other constructions. Volume is concerned, number is concerned, mass is concerned. So it's through those early experiences of playing with yarn balls and playing with building blocks that a child develops these, what Piaget would say, sorry, teacher trainer, it's occupational hazard, what well, Piaget would have described as mental schema. And that model we have in our heads of how the world around us works. Is there anybody who sat there thinking, he's wrong, he's got it wrong again? We give them these things so they become architects when they grow up. Okay, or builders when they grow up. Some will. But I think most of us would see reception as a little too early for vocational training. Yeah? Okay. The same applies to computing. Yeah? We give them the building blocks in Scratch or the programming tools to play with, to tinker with, so that they come to understand how the world works. Some of your pupils programming in Scratch or programming B-Bots with you will become the computer scientists or the software developers or the robotics engineers of the future. But that's not why we put it on the primary school curriculum. You know, those, who's, who's, who, here is, who here is teaching poetry? That's not as many of you as should be, by the way. <laughs> okay. You don't teach poetry in primary school because your country needs more poets. Okay? Some will become professional poets. It's a fairly slim chance, to be entirely honest with you. Yeah? But because through playing with poetry, through tinkering with poems, they come to learn how language works and have chance to express themselves. Now, as I say, some children will become software developers, just as you know, Frank Lloyd Wright went to a Froebel kindergarten, and he himself acknowledged the early influence of that work on his subsequent work as an architect. It's plausible, isn't it? Okay. But that's not the end. That's not where we're aiming for. The Royal Society reported a couple of years ago about the state of computing in schools. And they were very critical about the old ICT curriculum. I think unfairly so. I think they, were mu they should have been critical about some of the ICT exam specifications. But they said it's damaged goods. The brand has a tarnished reputation. Those of you, um, you know, if you look at GCSE ICT specifications, you might see some cause for that. Anybody old enough to remember Windscale becoming Sellafield? or Marathon becoming Snickers, or Star Opal Fruit Starburst. We have a rebranding exercise here of moving from the old ICT to the new computing. Yes, the name change reflects a change in focus from working with information to thinking about computation. But it is essentially a rebranding exercise. As part of that, we acknowledge that the domain contains these three elements. At its core, digital literacy, and I think the Royal Society was probably too narrow in their definition of that, what that means. And working with information technology, solving problems for other people, and then the fundamental foundational ideas of computer science. And we preserve that in the program study. If you want a way of thinking about it, you have these three aspects to it. Of the essential foundations of the domain, the computer science, how you apply those to solve real world problems, which I'd see as the IT, and then also what that means for me as a person, for us as a society, which is how I go about defining digital literacy, the implications, foundations, applications, implications. We had a couple of the early drafts where we were using that language. We reverted to CSIT and DL in the final version. Think, if you will, of using Google as an example of this. Anybody in the room not use Google as their search engine? Okay, you've got to worry a little about that, okay. Never since the Reformation has one organization controlled more people's access to information than Google do now. I believe they're good people, I really do believe they're good people, but if they were to use their powers for evil, then... So, how does Google work is a computer science question. How does Google do that so quickly? How do they give me the best result right top of the list? When was the last term, time you looked at page two of a Google? Search result. How, sorry? Yeah, that was a rhetorical question. That one. Okay. So how can they do that so quickly and so well? And then, of course, the stuff we've been teaching time and time again, how to use Google well, yeah? How to think about those results, how to check that that result is what you want, how to use the time or the location 
or the reading level filters to help you get to the results you want and can use more effectively. And then the implications of this, the fact that they know everything I have searched for ever, should that worry me? doesn't worry me in all honesty, but should it worry us? What's their business model? How can they can do that for all of us for free? Yeah, where does the money come from? When was the last time you ever clicked on a Google advert? Okay, that's again is a rhetorical question. You know, the, 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 the story goes that the reason why Google can do it for free is pretty much the same reason as farmers don't charge pigs for food. But, you know, I worry a little. Unless there are questions or comments or arguments arising from any of that preliminary stuff, I'm going to get into key stage one. Anybody want to argue with me now? <laughs> you can argue with me later, that's fine. Okay, right, on into key stage one then. And we scare you right from the start by throwing a word like algorithm at you in the very first bullet point of key stage one. The number of people who complained in the drafting process about we can't possibly expect primary school teachers to use words like algorithm. It's got like four syllables in it or something. Yeah? <laughs> Generally not primary school teachers themselves. Generally advisor and consultant types rather than primary school teachers. You are a generation of teachers who are using language like split vowel digraph with five-year-olds, okay? If algorithm is a scary word, then it really, sh it really shouldn't be, okay? It's a perfectly good English word to describe a perfectly interesting approach to thinking about problems, to thinking about how to solve problems. Anybody got a good working definition they're happy to share with the room? Algorithm. Following instructions, anybody else? Set of instructions I like, anybody else? Sorry? Not all algorithms need to be simple, but it's fine. This is good as a starting point, yeah? Set of, a sequence of instructions, a set of rules for solving a problem, for getting something done. That works for me as a starting point for this. Who here has been doing instructional writing with their pupils? Okay? You've been teaching them algorithms or you've been teaching them to write algorithms. You probably haven't used the phrase algorithm there, but drop it in the next time you're doing instructional writing and you're covering part of the computing curriculum. Yeah? My friend Ian Addison teaches computing at, sorry, my friend uh, Philip Bagg, who teaches computing at five primary schools down in Hampshire, talks about cookery as a classic example for this. And he has his pupils write out the algorithm for making a jam sandwich. If we had more time and the apparatus and somebody to clean up afterwards, we'd have a go at this now. But writing out, getting your pupils to write out the recipe for pizza, the recipe for making a jam sandwich. Brilliant way of teaching algorithms away from the computer. And Phil, of course, then implements that on a device. He takes on the persona of sandwich bot and acts out the instructions that they give to him, often with hilarious consequences. Here we go. You get the idea, there's more. To... <laughs> there is more to see there. So of course we do this with trainees at Roehampton. I take on the persona of sandwich bot and act out the, you know, the rule is you do exactly the instructions they give. So what do you do when the trainee says, do you spread jam on bottom? Well, <laughs> stop filming would be my advice to you at this point. So you have that idea there of the algorithm, the set of instructions. You then move to implementing that as code as a program on a particular device. For me, I think of programming as a two-step process, if you will. The first bit, coming up with the solution to the problem, thinking of the algorithm, thinking of the steps, thinking of the rules. The next bit is very particular, you know, specific skills of coding that on a particular device in a particular formal language. And the two are not entirely the same thing, but put together, that's kind of, for me, what programming is all about. So yes, you've got to think, anybody here with a background in foreign languages? 
Thank you very much. Did you do, ever do any poetry tra translation? Hard work? Very hard work. That's good. Okay, hard work isn't a bad thing. So I think there's something similar going on with programming, that coming up with the idea is right, like writing the poem, and then translating it into the target language requires a huge knowledge of vocabulary and grammar and the particular semantic rules of that language. But it's a different sort of work. It's a different sort of creativity. And of course we want both. You can have one without the other. But actually getting your algorithm to work on a particular digital device is great fun, and for that you need to do the coding thing. I say digital device, and we said digital device in the Q-Stage 1 program study, because if we'd said computer, you'd have thought it meant something like this, wouldn't you? Yeah, by saying digital device, we give fairly explicit permission that the Romas, for Valley into here today, the B-Bots, the Pro-Bots, are absolutely fine for dealing with this part of the Q-Stage 1 program study. There's nothing on the screen behind me that requires you to use technology more advanced than the stuff which is shown on the screen behind me. Okay. That said, if you've been using the B-Bots since they joined you in nursery, by the time they're halfway through year two, they might be ready to move on to something a little bit more advanced. So, of course, other robots are available. But you might want to, at that point, go onto the screen and start thinking about programming a screen turtle um, or a screen robot in Scratch, for instance. Other programming toolkits are available. So what we've got here is Scratch, and we've got these lovely sort of Lego-like building blocks. You know, the whole Froebel kindergarten analogy is quite deliberate, really it is. And then down the bottom here, I've made my own blocks. I'm hiding that from your view because that looks jolly complicated, and I certainly wouldn't want to scare you with that. But we can then create the instructions, create the program to move Roma from where she is there into the other circle here. Could you have a go, please, at thinking of the algorithm first? What are the steps to follow to move the Roma from the left-hand side there down to this, left-hand side there, down to this hoop here? How would you get it to do that? Move forward, thank you. Then turn 90 degrees, okay, because this is key stage one, we're not going to use technical language like degrees, we're just going to say right, because we're working quarter turns. Then what? Move forward again. Okay, that's fine. So we've got that algorithm there, move forward enough, turn right, move forward some more, essentially. And the, the translating that into code is a relatively straightforward process because of the degree of abstraction that's involved here. We need to specify how many times forward, and you kind of want to know how far does Roma move when we say move forward one. Well, Roma moves its own length. So how many of those lengths to move from here down here? How many steps forward? Four. I'm hearing a majority decision for four. Well, and they look, look, it just clicks together as if they were Lego bricks. Forward four of those, then turn right through a quarter turn, and then two more forward. Some people say three. Hands up two. Hands up three. Oh, it's evenly matched. I'm going to go with the two as the majority position there. So now, could you use logical reasoning if you brought it with you? Just guess otherwise. Where is Roma going to end up when we implement this program, when we run this program? Nowhere, okay? We've not said go. Okay. Oh, you want to do the proper scratch green flag thing, yeah? Okay, I can just click on this. Okay. I mean, if you want to, we can have this event driven. Click on the green flag, run the program. I better break that apart now. Okay, so we click on the green flag, move it forward, turn right, move it forward, another two. What's going to happen? I'm going to stop. Let's have a go, shall we? One, two, three, four. Turn right, one. We have a winner. Very, very impressive. Much more impressive than the Manchester group. <laughs> okay. But with the Manchester group, we then got to do some debugging because we had to fix the program which they'd written. Once you've got it on screen, and I think this is a nice point of transition from working with the concrete operation or the Roma, the Bebot, on the table or on the carpet to working with the virtual Roma. Nothing introduced. It's the same commands here. But once it's in Scratch, oopsie daisy, you get all of the other things which Scratch provides. So you can do sorts of things with data. We can have the Roma play some sounds. We can have all of that going on. Um, but what about this program here? Put the pen down, repeat four times, 
forward twice, turn right. What's going to happen when I run that? For a square. I'd like you to use logical reasoning to explain how you know that it's going to be a square. I think that's pretty impressive logical reasoning. Just running the program isn't evidence of logical reasoning. Asking the learner what's going to happen is evidence of logical reasoning. Let's have a go at it. Feeling confident? Yes. You too. There we go. You're absolutely spot on. Must be a square, mustn't it? OK, back to show you a few more slides. As I say, other programming toolkits are available. Other digital devices are available. The one downside with Scratch at the moment is that it won't run on the shiny iPad-like things. Anybody move to iPads as their principal means of delivering curriculum supporting learning? OK, other tools are available. So on the iPad, you have a lovely B-Bot app, which is much more of a game. Can you move Bebop from the starting point to the end point? There's a nice thing out there called Daisy the Dinosaur. There are many, many other tools as well. When you Make sure you get Daisy the Dinosaur. Roehampton's tech team installed Daisy the Cow, which is... <laughs> OK. Anybody here played Angry Birds? Yeah, isn't it brilliant? If you want an excuse for game-based learning in Key Stage 1, this is it if you needed one. Because how else can you play Angry Birds? but to use logical reasoning to predict the behavior of this simple program. Yeah? We know that's how we get the, the, the bird to hit the pigs. All of that stuff about you know children become violent because they play video games. Do you remember all those reports a couple of years ago about children throwing birds at pigs? <laughs> Me neither. Okay. And then all of the stuff you were doing under the old curriculum, you're welcome to carry on doing. Yeah? So use technology purposefully to create, organize, store, manipulate, and retrieve digital content. Anybody in the room who was teaching an ICT lesson that did not involve using technology to purpose, purposefully to create, organize, store, manipulate, retrieve digital content? It's possible, but it's unlikely, isn't it? So the stuff that worked well, the lessons you enjoyed teaching, they enjoyed learning, feel free to carry on. Do not ditch your old software. Still entirely relevant to the new program study. Um, and then this lovely bullet point used to be part of the early learning goals, recognizing common uses of IT beyond school. And this is kind of what we've taken as a starting point for much of the work we've done on switched on computing. So for instance, take unit 2.3 as an example. We are photographers. You have children routinely taking digital photographs themselves with their digital device, whether it's a camera or the camera app or whatever, phone or tablet they happen to be using. Bring some of that experience into the classroom, but then meet them where they are and take them onto someplace new. So talk about how to take good digital photographs rather than just taking digital photographs. Show them how to organize those, how to delete the ones that aren't very good would be a really useful skill to have. Okay? How to manipulate those, how to improve the image, how to put those into folders, how to categorize those. Perhaps start talking about the GPS geolocation tagging on there or the facial recognition and the implications, digital literacy, of some of that. And, you know, for other things on there, we've taken a similar idea, although for Unit 2.1, we are astronauts. There's probably not a huge amount of practical experience they'll be directly drawing on, but you never know for the future. Okay, and of course, what more common use of IT beyond school than the digital devices we have in our pockets. Anybody done the survey with their school no, or their class? Know how many children in your class have got a smartphone of their own? How many? And what age group are you teaching? You have four, five of them with smartphones. OK, anybody else? Golly. By the end of primary school, they all have something you know, comparable to this. I was hearing the story the other day of children in reception with their own BlackBerry. Absolutely astonished. Really was. People still using BlackBerry. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if they're going to have access to these devices, then you've got to start thinking about how to use them, how to use them well, and teaching something of how they work. Yeah? Recognizing common uses of IT beyond school. Can you believe, here we are, March 2014, and we still have no statutory requirement for you to teach children how to keep themselves safe online. 
it's ridiculous, it really is. Come September, it becomes part of the national curriculum, and I think we would have to say about time too. I trust most of you have been covering this already. That's good. You've not kind of been saying, no, not on the national curriculum, <laughs> not teaching you anything about that. And of course, Ofsted are expecting you to do that. That's not the same as putting it there as an entitlement for everybody. And the requirement of use stage one is relatively straightforward. Use technology safely and respectfully. Notice the second bullet, Tom, the second point there as well. Keep your personal information private. We know that that means not putting your phone number, not putting your photos onto the public web. But keeping your personal information <laughs> private could include much else as well, like thinking twice about your digital footprint, thinking twice about the search history that you create, using HTTPS when it's available rather than HTTP. What about deleting your internet history? Is that something you teach children as part of keep your personal information private? See how that goes down with the network manager. Okay, and where to go for help and concerns when they help when they have concerns about content or contact? Um, out of interest, you know, where are the places you would recommend children in Key Stage One to go if they have concerns about content or contact? Teacher is a good place. Absolutely, come and tell me if there's anything that bothers you. Somebody else? Yeah. Parents would be also a very, very good place. It's worth having a third place. <laughs> Some children would be so embarrassed about telling you or their parents about something that they've seen or even done, they just won't. It's worth saying there's a third place where you can always go. Where would be your third place for them? Friends is interesting. CIOP is a really good answer, but wrong. Okay? Because a key stage one child, a six year old, going onto the CIOP website gets sent straight back to tell you or their parents. CIOP don't want to know from children in key stage one. They say get a parent or your teacher to help you fill in the form. For good reasons. You know, no criticism is implied, but it doesn't solve my problem of a third place. Childline won't do that. And so having the child line 0800 1111 poster up in your computer lab or your library, don't make a big deal of it. You don't want to generate loads of false positives. But just make them aware that there is somewhere else they can go if they don't want to come and talk to you, if they don't want to come and talk to their parents about it. That's key stage one pretty much covered. Okay, that's a couple of years to teach all of that. Anybody want to ask anything about that before I go on into key stage two? Okay, right, let's have a look at the key stage two stuff as well. More programming, more computer science, that won't come as a surprise to anybody. But notice that the programs have to have a specific goal. It's programming with a purpose. It's not just learning about programming because programming is something good to learn about. It's writing programs to do something. And there are a couple of suggestions of things which you might like to do there. One of which is controlling physical systems, another is simulating physical systems. Playing Angry Birds, brilliant for key stage one. Making your own Angry Birds, or Flappy Bird if you want something a little more contemporary, great for key stage two, okay? By the end of key stage two, okay, making the whole of Angry Birds would be ambitious, but let's be ambitious about it. Making a level in Angry Birds in scratch, not out of the question. Really it isn't, okay? We deliberately said controlling or simulating because we didn't want people to have to go out and buy the lovely Lego kit, although you know, the Lego kit is really lovely. I'll come on to that in a moment, though. But it is also the meta stuff about solving problems by decomposing them into smaller parts. Just as you're going to teach algorithms across the curriculum in Key Stage 1 about instructional writing and take your trip to Pizza Express and make your sandwiches, similarly in Key Stage 2, decomposing problems into smaller parts. That's not just for your computing lessons, really it isn't, okay? Planning a story, doing a research project, um, solving a maths problem, you take a problem and break it into smaller parts. Design and technology work, planning a science experiment, it's all about decomposing problems, not all about, but it's main, mostly about decomposing problems into smaller parts. So as I say, we didn't need you to go out and buy the robotics kit, but over on the design and technology curriculum, they do need you to go out and buy some of the control hardware for that, or at least to use control hardware. So apply their understanding of computing to program, monitor, or control their products. Lovely to see that written into the design and technology curriculum. Applications of what they're learning in computing over in D&T, and the links between the two subjects are such 
interesting ones to explore. And remember, of course, that cooking is also part of the design and technology curriculum. We come back to that. Have we got time to do the uh, Not really. So you can do all of this with Lego. Other kit is available, but yeah. Other kit is available. The Lego stuff plugs straight into Scratch 1.4, though, which means you can take the programming skills that they've done on screen in Scratch and apply that to the Lego hardware, too. We then get into the detail of what sort of programming should they do, and there is some technical vocabulary being thrown at you there as well. So you sequence, selection, repetition in programs, work with variables, work with various forms of input and output. So here's one of my trainees' work. This is Sam. What he's doing, anybody here using Education City? Mathletics, it's lovely stuff, it really is. Essentially, this is Skinner and behaviorism. Stimulus, response, reward. I'm going to ask you a question, you're going to respond to me. If you get it right, I'll give you a biscuit or I'll give you some points or whatever. Yeah? Nothing wrong with that as a way of reinforcing certain you know, factual knowledge like the tables or spellings or whatever. So Sam's having a go at doing his own educational game using Scratch as a tool. Yeah. So what's going on in this program? Well, we have something event-driven. When, when it receives a signal to say the wolf has appeared, then we set things up in a particular way. We go to a place, we appear, we play some noise, we glide to another place, we then play some audio. We set a couple of variables. The level starts at level one, the score starts at zero. I can't tell you how Sam managed to figure out those numbers. It's no commenting on the code. He then repeats the next thing six times. He picks a random number for A, he picks a random number for B, and then makes a question up saying, what is that random number times this random number, and waits to see what answer they type in. They type in an answer. If they get it right, he increases the score. He says, well done, and something complicated might happen to the level. If they get it wrong, then he says, wrong. How's that for feedback? And then after six times, it says what they scored, and then it goes on to the next level of the game. There we are. Your year fours ought to be able to. Okay, with a bit of a run up of learning programming over a few weeks' terms up to that point. That's not, seriously, that is not out of question. It's something for year four to be able to do. After working towards an educational game like that, entirely within your, their capabilities, really. Okay. And they might probably do better at artwork as their illustration for that. But you've got a lovely cross phase thing. Year four, writing educational games for year two to play. It's a lovely way of testing the user experience of the software which they develop in that. If we had more time, I'd walk you through making one of these things. The programs that they write won't work first time. That's where the fun comes in, okay? The worst. No, it's not the worst possible thing, but it's a really bad idea for you to be the fount of knowledge on this, for you to have to deal with Miss, so uh, they would know which is which, there's selection for you. Okay, <laughs> my program doesn't work, can you fix it for me? Your default answer to those questions is no, okay? My friend Nicholas Schofield works at school down the road from us, has a rubber duck on each computer in her computer lab, and the first thing the child has to do when it doesn't work is to tell the rubber duck what the program does and to explain the algorithm to the program. And these rubber duck, ducks are amazing because they will, through just simply telling the rubber duck what it's meant to do, most of the time the children will figure out for themselves what had gone wrong in their program. Explaining it using logical reasoning to somebody else, even a rubber duck, if you want to, you could use, a, you could use your Lego duck for that purpose. A whole set of Lego ducks for that purpose. We'll fix that. We've got, let me show you the thing of program going wrong here. BBC Cracking Code. What do we do now? Well, we need to put speed in. Okay. We set speed to a value. It's worth just pausing there to look at the structure of her program. Notice we have a sequence of instructions there. We have a repeating loop going in. Uh, we have a couple of selection statements, if this, then that, if the other, then something else. And we have a variable there for speed. So sequence, selection, repetition, working with various forms of input output, but not so much, but working with variables is going on. Okay. And then one of the flag that should be Whoops, looks like this car's having trouble staying on the track. Mm -hmm. 
what was going on? I'm not sure. So should we try slower speed so we've just got a bit more time to see it? So let's try five. Yeah. Cool. Okay, and that's a really interesting debugging challenge. Getting that program working smoothly, I will leave as an exercise for you. Have a go at it in Scratch. Um, here's one I made earlier, which didn't work particularly well. There are a couple of <laughs> other bullet points on the CS on computer science territory, which is really worth mentioning. It's easy to overlook these and think computer science is just coding. It isn't, or just programming. It isn't. You've also got this thing about understanding networks, including the internet. If you think the coding stuff is ambitious, remember that by the end of year six, your pupils have to understand the internet. Okay? That's quite a challenging thing to get across. And a lot of the work that's being done is about teaching children programming and not so much focusing on this sort of bullet point. Okay, your five child comes up to your break time. Miss, uh, again, example of selection for you. What's the difference between the internet and the web? How do you respond? Google it is a good answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Why not? Inquiry based learning. No problem with that. Anybody else? Sit down and get on with practicing the SATs. The web is on the internet. I feel fairly comfortable with that as a definition. They're both about making connections. Yeah? The internet is about connecting computers together. And we're talking about huge amount of physical hardware. Yeah? We're talking about routers and switches and gateway machines and computers and network cards and wireless infrastructure to make those connections between one device and another. One country here at UCL, the first UK, uh, no, non-US node on the internet to talk about this. But we use that, or the main use we've found for that now is about connecting documents Together. So Berners-Lee, writing you know, pretty much 25 years ago, said we have this thing called hypertext, which lets us link one document on our computer to another document on our computer. And we have the internet, which connects all these computers together. Why not combine the two and have a document on one computer able to use hypertext to take you to, to link to a document stored on an entirely other computer? And what a genius idea giving that to the world for free. It's the feedback from his line manager that amuses me. You know, vague, but exciting. You know, write that on the bottom of a child's piece of work, OK? But notice also the IT, the digital literacy, the digital literacy side of this, the opportunities this offers for communication and collaboration. Any of you doing 100-word challenge? OK, explain 100-word challenge, please. That's pretty impressive. And comments then from across the world on the hundred words that they've written. I remember when I was at school, the only person who read my work was my teacher. You know, a child in your school tomorrow, writing with an audience of two and a half billion people, potentially. If you get that many hits to your blog, then you might need to upgrade the infrastructure. But you know, <laughs> potentially. The audience for their work. And there's you know, strong evidence that this is a really motivating thing for children. And then we get to the stuff I was talking about earlier in relation to Google, to use search technologies effectively. Of course, we need to teach that. And of course, it should say safely and effectively more about safety in a little while. To appreciate how the results are selected and ranked. How does Google choose what to put top of the list, please? Sorry? How much you pay? Not quite, but you're on the right track. The Open University, for the advert which they've got placed there at the top, hasn't cost them a penny. But they bid in an instant online auction to say, if somebody were to click on it, we would be willing to pay up to this much. And the price is fixed, so that when I click on the link, then money changes hands. Oliver's going to take exception to this and say, this is unethical practice, but company annoying you? Google them. Start clicking their advert. Okay. Okay. If it's Google that's annoying you, you've got to find another solution. Okay. Right. And then, you know, but below that, you know, what comes top of the list that they won't accept 
money for? How does Google choose what to put top of that list? Not quite, but you're on the... Somebody said backlinks. I'm sure I overheard backlinks. Thank you. What do you mean by backlinks? Absolutely. Google these days apparently pay attention to 200 signals, and my list of search results may be different from your list of search results. But principally, top of the list is this is established by a thing called PageRank, Larry Page, one of Google's founders, and it's the number and quality of inbound links. You will often find Wikipedia goes high up the list of Google results, yeah? Because loads of other websites link to that Wikipedia article, and so they get some of the kudos. If you want to get your school website higher up Google results, Get a link to it from Wikipedia, and you can borrow some of the kudos from Wikipedia for your site, too. And then we have you know, the digital literacy element about being discerning and evaluating the digital content. And not, you know, we know not to trust Wikipedia. <laughs> we know not to trust Wikipedia because it's made up by people. You know, a secret for you, don't tweet this bit. The rest of the web is made up by people, too. Just because I can't edit the Daily Mail's website doesn't mean to say everything on there is something which I should necessarily assume is factually accurate or want to cite in my essays. I mean, Roehampton trainees. Okay. So you can do this for yourself. Let's take a website here. This is one they prepared earlier. And bring, now, remember, this has come across the internet onto my computer. Once it's on my computer, there's very little the government can do about what I do with it. So I can, for instance, activate Mozilla's X-ray goggles, and then the page becomes editable. If you don't think that name change was necessary, that's fine. You can do something about it. ICT programs of study, we're happy with that? Okay, so, and you can change the rest of that. So if you don't like one of those bullet points, I can delete that. <laughs> okay. Anybody in the room thinking I'm hacking the government's web server in front of live witnesses? <laughs> That's all right, though. Anybody in the room worried about copyright now? Okay. You shouldn't be. Okay. Firstly, parody becomes an allowed exception to copyright come next June or thereabouts. But also, this content is covered by the Open Government License. We paid for this. We can do what we want with this. Okay? We're allowed to make our modifications to this. So if you're working in a free school and academy independent school, I very much encourage you to do that with the national curriculum. Yeah? You don't have to follow this. Make your own. Maybe use ours as a starting point, but it's entirely up to you. It really is. Um, so we've got that there. And you know, teaching children to do that, maybe not so much with the head teacher's blog. But maybe doing that with one or two web pages, showing it to their parents. Can you see what I've done? Can you find the mistake on that? Children learning that the web is something made up by people. And unless you're very, very careful, you can be taken in by seemingly very plausible um, web pages. You know, don't do it with lot of results because it's a recipe for disaster. There. Who's teaching year six? Okay. What do you reckon to that for a level five English? You know, would you give that level five in an English writing assessment? I'd have my doubts, in all honesty. This is not well written, I don't think. We've got a whole train wreck of drafting there. Some of this, I think, is if you take it entirely literally, some of that is, I think, pretty much impossible with the state of modern technology. But remember, Nick Gibb had in mind a curriculum that would last a 1,000 years. Break it apart into three bullet points, and it becomes a lot easier to think about, a lot easier to teach. And of course, all of the stuff you've been doing, much of the stuff you've been doing in ICT is covered by this. There are lovely tools out there, Office 365, Google Apps for Education, great tools for covering many, many of these bullet points. The one thing I draw attention to now is the data statement in here. The previous national curriculum focused so much on information. And of course, you know, data is a type of information, I think, for most of us. But by saying data, we were deliberately saying, do the quali quantitative stuff as well. Do the surveys. Work with big data. Think how important these, hu these huge collections of data are in so many real-world algorithms. Current version of Excel work with, I think, 16 million rows of data. You can get tables. You can get data of that size and put those into the hands of your pupils and get them to do some really interesting analysis. Please don't do the class survey thing. What color hair have you got? What color eyes have you got? You know, firstly, it's really boring. Secondly, you kind of need to be registered with the Information, Communi uh, Information Commissioner's Office for processing personal data. Do something interesting. Anonymous surveys. 
What do they think about the way computing is taught in your school? What do they think about the way the filters are set in your school? Get them doing something where they're going to be interested in the results rather than just practicing the technical skills. And finally, we get to the e-safety statement. I say e-safety, but there's also responsibility in here, and that's important. Yeah? I think top end of primary school, many of the problems you encounter with e-safety are not so much children being, thank God, children being groomed by creepy people on the internet, but they're to do with children being beastly to one another on the internet. They're to do with children not ever, sorry, hardly ever, bothering to check terms and conditions. Children who think it's okay to lie about their age to Facebook so as to get a profile. Yeah? Strictly in contravention of Facebook's terms and conditions, probably an offense under the Computer Misuse Act. Okay, Facebook are unlikely to sue. But, you know, being you know, acting with honesty, acting with integrity. They find that hard because they're young and don't yet have a fully developed moral code. But one of our responsibilities is to teach them these things. That we are nice to one another. We treat one another as we would hope to be treated. We don't lie about our age. We don't lie about things. And, you know, the other one, of course, is accessing material which they jolly well shouldn't at their age or indeed any age. But to helping them develop that sense of moral responsibility. You know, being here with Jeremy Bentham and thinking of the panoptica, the fact that everything that they do on the web leaves a data trail, that every searched query that they type in creates part of their digital footprint, that's something which they ought to start considering. Yes, we live in a benign liberal democracy at the moment, thank goodness. But who's to say in 30 years' time what government will then choose to do with the data which they've accumulated? That's on that sobering note. Let's go and have got. Oh, hold on. Let's just. Is there anything you want to get off your chest now? Fine. Okay. Which case? Ruth, half an hour. Let me introduce Ruth from Rising Stars. Hello, Ruth. <laughs> We are going to try to keep the time today, so thank you very much. Yeah, well, that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Former head teacher, yes. assemblies, nobody could tell me to stop talking. <laughs> so um, we've, got, we've got about 25 minutes um, for refreshments, and, uh, and then back in here for classes next session.